Okay, so today we are going to do the barley. Uh, barley is sa'ora, sa'ora in Hebrew, and I found something really interesting about it today, but I'm going to wait and we'll talk about it later. You know, I, I'm so grateful that I decided to um, do Hebrew because it has opened so many doors for me to understand the words a little bit deeper because God has a meaning in all the words. So the barley basically represents the Hebrew believers before Yeshua. So we're going to look at why. <coughs> so, <clears throat> sorry. There are nine stages of growing barley. So why the barley? Maybe why did God pick the barley to represent the Hebrew people? The first eight stages are germination, seedling development, uh, sterling, whatever that is, stem elongation, boot, head emergence, flowering, and milk development. So there's different stages. So just like the Hebrew people developed, okay, um, they were from the beginning and they were bake, basically infant-like. Um, they were just developing and then there was Abraham and then there, you know, he learned something more and then there was Moses, they gave us even more. So they were sort of like a grain of wheat or barley. The ninth stage or the ripening stage has two parts. And so this is interesting too. They have, they have a hard to divide kernel and a cannot dent kernel. So the wheat and barley, and we're gonna talk about this here in a minute. Uh, the wheat and barley were planted in the autumn and ripened in the spring. Barley matured faster and would be harvested sooner. The first fruits of grain offered during the Feast of Unleavened Bread would have been barley. In the early stages of the Israelite settlement, the most important cereal was barley because of the necessity to settle fringe areas and barley's tolerance to harsh conditions. So we see the Hebrew people as they were developing, they de developed um, from like Adam and then um, Abraham, Moses, they kept developing. And then they have these two parts of their, um, their um, uh, last ripening stages, okay? Uh, the first part is the hard to divide kernel. And that part, they use that for um, grain and cereals and everything like that. And then cannot dent. That's used for flour. So there's two parts to um, the barley. So that's how the history of the people were of, like barley. Now, in order for the Israelites to know the seasons, they would look at the barley harvest. When the barley was at the, in the first stage of harvest, so the first stage of harvest was the, it was just hard to dent. In other words, you could eat the barley. So that's why they ate it for cereal because they could chew it and eat it. And um, that was the first stage. Uh, when the barley was in the first stage of harvest, the next new moon would be the beginning of a new year, and they, we call it the spring or aviv. If the barley was not harvestable, then it would be the next new moon that would start the new year. So the ground would be the signal of the seasons. So the ground that was producing the barley told whether or not it was actually spring yet. So otherwise, the moon would keep going and spring wouldn't be spring anymore and the, and the seasons wouldn't be the right seasons. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Everything would keep moving. It's sort of like, <coughs> I think the Muslim, the Ramadan, <clears throat> I think Ramadan, Ramadan eventually happens all year long because they don't have a way to um, compensate for the seasons. But I, I don't necessarily think Ramadan is based on the seasons anyway. But because all of the feasts of the Lord are based on the seasons, the seasons has to be in the correct place. So this is the way they do it. So um, 
it's called the Jewish leap year when they have to add another um, month. So Nisan, remember we talked about Nisan is actually the beginning of the year, the first month. And then in the month of Nisan is when you have Passover, Feast of First Fruits, and um, not Shavuot because that's the next month. But anyway, so it starts in Nisan. And it, here's how it goes down this way. Then it comes to Adar. Adar is the last month. The seventh month is Tishri. That's when Rosh Hashanah is. I did find a calendar, kind of a, a little thing where maybe I should put over here some of the, the feasts and festivals that are, because God designated the different months uh, for the holidays. So in a Jewish leap year, an extra month is added after the month of Shabbat and before the month of Adar. It's called Adar Aleph or Adar Rishon, which is the first, or Adar One. Uh, then the month of Adar is referred to, the second one is Adar Bet, Adar Shani, or Adar Two. According to the Jewish tradition, Adar is a lucky and happy month. <clears throat> so it's sort of like our leap day, um, but we have they have a leap month, <laughs> but then they just add in another month. So you're going along here and you get to Shavat. And if the barley is uh, Aviv or ready to harvest, then you go on and it's just a dark. But you get to uh, the end of Shavat and the barley's not ready to harvest yet, then you have to wait a month. So if you wait a month, then you have, that's a dar all if you're starting, and then you'll have an adar bet. Everybody understand that? Any questions? I have a couple. Okay. So just in trying to um, make sense of the month names and all, Nissan, you said, is more spring. So that would be like our March? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, dang it, I totally it flew out of my head. Tishri is oh, well. around September. Okay. Well, and Kis Kislev is uh, usually Hanukkah. So... So if they have to add a month, how does that correspond with our calendar of 365 days? Okay, well, that's the reason why uh, Passover mm -hmm. and Easter are not always together. Okay, because Easter, our calendar, is based on our calendar, the sun. So Easter okay. is based on the sun and the Jewish calendar is based on the moon. So yeah, they're not always together. So some years, I think last year, actually, uh, Easter and Passover were almost the same day. I think Passover was the night before Easter or something. Yeah. Okay. Now, this year, it's not going to be the same. It'll probably be like a week apart. And then it'll be like two weeks apart. And then it'll be three weeks apart. And then the Jewish calendar will add another month. And then it'll be together again. So that's how it happens. Uh, okay. So they get farther and farther apart until the, they're never more than a month apart because after they're a month apart, then uh, the Hebrew calendar adds another month. Does that make sense? Yes. And then over time, our calendar and their calendar kind of starts resyncing, but it's not for a while. And then, like you said, the Easter and Passover were kind of right there at the same. Is that what happens since that month is added? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really understand why the Catholic church decided to go with the sun God rather than uh, go with the Hebrew calendar, but they did. And so that's why and, they, and then they don't celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. They don't celebrate it at Passover. So it's, it's very confusing. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of it's hard to be uh, understanding both of the different worlds <laughs> because they're, they're so different. Yeah. And the calendars are different, of course. Anyway, so that's how, that's how you know when the barley is ripe. And um, the fact that the barley itself has uh, two harvests, 
is so exciting to me. You know, the wheat only has one harvest, but the barley has two harvests because we, we're going to see here that there has been a barley harvest. And then when Jesus comes again, there's going to be another harvest of Jewish believers. So anyway, to me, it's exciting. So we're going to look at first fruits or Shavuot, which is part of the barley harvest that I think we've talked about this before, but it comes again when you talk about the barley, of course. Leviticus 23.10 says, speak to the children of Israel and tell them, when you have come into the land which I give to you and shall reap its harvest, then you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the Kohen. So, or the Kohenim. Um, they um, bring barley because the barley is the one that is ripe and the barley is the one that determines the spring. The barley is the one that does a lot of the determining of the, the seasons. Which just, just dawned on me the fact that even in the end times, the barley or the Jewish believers are the ones that are determining the Christ's second coming. Because in Christ's second coming, what do the Jewish believers have to cry out in order for him to come again? Baruch Hababa Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They have to, they have to believe uh, he comes to save Israel. And so uh, that's kind of interesting too. Uh, Leviticus 23, 13 says, and you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheep, a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. So you, at first fruits, you have the barley, the first of the barley harvest, and you have a male lamb that's pure. Newly harvested grain could not be eaten until the first fruits of grain had been offered on the day after the Sabbath of the festival of unleavened bread. So you could eat all the old grain. So they would make their matzah and everything out of the old grain. You couldn't eat of the new grain until after it had been declared uh, ready to harvest, which makes sense. I mean, cause you haven't harvested it anyway. Uh, Pentecost near the end of the grain harvest included grain and loaf offerings and Pentecost was also called the feast of harvest so <clears throat> sometimes there's a mix-up um, because there were two harvests right there was the heart the first one of the grain that was used for cereals and then there was the second harvest of the, the barley that was hard that was used for wheat. Does that make sense? Any questions? So we're gonna look at what happened the day Yeshua died. Oh, excuse me, Sue? Yeah. You mean the second was used not for wheat, but for flour? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I thought that's what you... <laughs> yes, please correct Sorry. me. No, no, um, you're good. I'm thinking flour in my head. Uh, yeah, it doesn't always come out the way I'm thinking, right? No, per, no, it's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The first, the first was for like the cereal, and the second was for the flour. Yes. So because there was two ripenings, there was also two harvests, and the and one harvest was uh, when Jesus rose again, and the other harvest was at Pentecost. Interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, so Matthew 27 50 says and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice he gave up his spirit at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom the earth shook the rocks split and the tombs broke open the body of many holy people who had died were raised to life they came out of the tombs after Jesus's resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people Jesus said, do not touch me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brother and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So at this time, there were people walking around Jerusalem, Old, Old Testament saints who had been basically raised from the dead. There was, it was a resurrection. Did it say what they were doing? No, <laughs> <laughs> just kind of curious. Were they partying, or you know? 
Okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I mean, didn't say, you know, there's so much when we get to heaven, like we're going to have to ask, <laughs> what did you do when you came out? I bet the people were like, they probably didn't even believe, you know, like, who are you? Maybe people didn't even know who they were. I don't know. I have, I have no clue. We could only speculate. But when Jesus rose from the, the grave, um, the women had, were going to the tomb and they saw them, saw him, and they wanted to hug him, right? Wouldn't that be your first response? Jesus, and go and want to hug him. But he, he said, no, you can't touch me yet, for I haven't ascended. So he was actually telling them where he was going, right? He was going to the father, um, and he was the high priest that was taking the first fruits to uh, the father uh, as a fulfillment of the feast of first fruits. And he was the unblemished male lamb. So, and how do we know that he ascended to his father? How do we know he went there? A week later, John 20, 27 says, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side stop doubting and believe so just a week later he was telling people you know to touch him so at first he could not be touched he had to be clean and pure he could not untouched unblemished he, when he went uh to the father and took uh the feast of first all the first fruits any questions <coughs> All right, so I, I did find another um, testimony, I guess, or commentary on the same thing here. At Christ's death, a strong earthquake occurred, splitting rocks. Truly, the death of Christ was a powerful earth-shaking event with repercussions affecting even the creation. A third event mentioned was re recorded only by Matthew. The tombs of many righteous people were opened. The NIV suggests that these saints were resurrected when Jesus died and then went into Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection. A number of commentators agree with this view. However, their resurrection did not occur till he was raised. In, in, this, in this view, the phrase after Jesus' resurrection goes with the words were raised to life and came out of the tomb. So I, I kind of believe that when Jesus rose from the tomb, they arose from the tomb, probably at the same time. This is possible in the Greek and is suggested in the King James Version and the NASB. The tombs then broke open at Christ's death, probably by the earthquake, thus heralding Christ's triumph in death over sin, but the bodies were not raised till Christ was raised. So this is just a commentary that I found that gave us a, another opinion. Either way, Leviticus 23, 12 through 13 was fulfilled. A sheaf of barley and the unblemished land were presented before the throne of God. Uh, Volver uh, suggests this event was a fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits of Harvest mentioned in Leviticus 23. On that occasion, as a token of the coming harvest, the people would bring a handful of grain to the priest. The resurrection of these saints occurring after Jesus himself was raised is a token of the coming harvest when all the saints will be raised. Any questions? <coughs> Therefore, we can assume that the first harvest, the barley harvest, represents all the Old Testament saints that were raised at this time and taken with Yeshua to the Father as the first fruit believers. So this is what I found out about the word barley. So the root of the word barley, barley is sa-ora, sa-ora. And in Hebrew, you take the, the letters, the first three letters are the root letters of the word. So it would be uh, uh, sin, ein, and resh, these three here. When you put them together, it's sa-ar. Sa-ar means gate. So I thought, oh my word, how awesome that the barley believers were the gateway to the new covenant, opening the door to all believers, both Jew and Gentiles. 
I just thought that was kind of interesting. Just a beautiful picture of how, how who would have related barley to gate, you know, unless you know that there was a reason that the barley harvest was going to be a gateway to all believers. Anybody have any comments or? I wonder in heaven, since you were doing all of this stuff on words and we're bringing in the Hebrew, if, if we'll be speaking Hebrew in heaven, I don't know. Well, I definitely believe you'll be understanding it. <laughs> Uh, you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I mean, it may be a totally different language, but. I, well, I do think that it's going to be fascinating because um, so much is in languages. Like in, I think in the Chinese character for creation, there's a tree and a snake. So there's so much from the beginning of the people who spread out from Noah, they knew and got handed down and then it kind of some of it's in our languages that's neat wasn't it mm, i'm trying to remember babylon and they were trying to build the tower of babylon yeah. and then god made it to where it's like he already had all these languages out there he made it to where all everybody couldn't speak the same language i'm curious what that original language was that they were speaking before that happened and if that had anything to do with well, of course it did because it's in the Bible and it's part of God's plan. But do y'all know what that original language oh, was? No. Mm. I'll have to look that up. No, but it, somebody would probably tell you it was ancient, ancient Hebrew because uh, ancient Hebrew is more of a um, picture, word picture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the olive was an ox and with horns and stuff. Um, it was more of picture graph which like you said, um, the Chinese language is more pictures. And um, so I don't know, could be the more. Patterns of, the Patterns of Evidence documentary, the third one goes uh -huh. into that um, beginning pictograph language. It's fascinating to show how when we needed a um, alphabetic based language how god must have given it to the hebrews it's just a fact it'll it'll make you cry because it's just the evidence and stuff is just fascinating how god just gives us what exactly what we needed because he needed um moses to record this right well you'll have to send me the link and i'll try to send it to everybody yeah that would be great i would love to see that yeah that'd be cool i i don't know i mean Nobody can know everything, let's just put it that way. <laughs> but there's certain things I haven't really delved into. I've been so busy, so but that that sounds very interesting. Yeah, I never have really I have been so busy trying to learn conversational Hebrew and now biblical Hebrew that ancient Hebrew it's like uh, no, don't not I, I, you know, that's just too much for me. <laughs> So, but I know it's out there and I know people really study it. There's well, I appreciate you doing all this, Sue, because this is so beyond me because this is a hard language. Yes. I, I mean, I love doing it. There was a lady at one of my congregations and she would hand out different uh, passages and she'd write it all in that ancient Hebrew. And I'm like, I thought to myself, how many people know that? I mean, you have a congregation here. They may know real Hebrew, but they're not going to know ancient Hebrew. But anyway, she loved doing it. So, okay. <laughs> so here's the questions for you. How were the Jews aviv for the coming Messiah? So you know what Aviv means? It means they were they were ready to harvest. Nobody? Well, it was just Jesus was here. And so what were the all of the Jews were looking towards the Messiah, right? So they yes. they, they were ready to be harvested because the the way of salvation or the plan that god had before yeshua 
was different than the plan of salvation after Yeshua. So there had, there had to be a gate or, or a point in time where people were no longer judged by the old standards, but now by the new standards. Does that make sense? So the, yeah. Jews, the Jews were ready because they were looking. This was the point. Jesus, Yeshua was the point where they were all looking for the Messiah and they were ready for him. So they were ready to be harvested. And they had 400 years of silence waiting for the Messiah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and just like the barley itself, they had been developed. And um, I always wanted to do a book on my child humanity and how God took humanity, starting with Adam and Eve, as, as like a baby in the womb in, in a garden that was pure. And he walked with them and talked to them and they heard his voice. And anyway, it, it was just one of the things I felt like when you stand back and you look at, at time itself, it's uh, humanity is God's child. And so <clears throat> he was taking them, progressing them little by little uh, as a baby, as a toddler, as a, as a child in school, educating them. And, and then for me, Yeshua was the bar bat mitzvah. It was the time when People are now accountable to their themselves, okay? So before Yeshua, it was more of a corporate salvation, okay? Um, at least they felt that way. I don't know if it was or not because it was, their, it was still their heart that determined it, but it was looked upon as a corporate thing. In other words, it was always uh, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew people, the Hebrew people. Um, God saved the Hebrew people, God saved the Hebrew people. But after Yeshua, salvation was individual. So like a bar bat mitzvah, before your bar bat mitzvah, you are part of the family. So your family is the one that is determining your salvation. But after that, after, after your bar bat mitzvah, you become a man and now you are individually accountable for your sins. You can't blame it on your mom and your dad. <laughs> That's what I tell my kids when they turn 13. I said, okay, you're a teenager. Any sin that you have now, you, you have to go to God. You, you are, are individually accountable. You're no longer a child. So um, the, the Jews were ready. They were ready at this point. Uh, we did talk about why the Old Testament saints would be the first fruits. Uh, what happened at Shavuot that completed the harvest of the Jews and began the sowing of the wheat of the Gentiles? Okay, so Shavuot, we haven't really talked about it but sh yet uh, here, but <clears throat> remember Shavuot was Pentecost. So what happened at Pentecost that completed the harvest of the Jews? The Holy Spirit came upon believers. The Holy Spirit came, yes. So, um, and I, you know, honestly, I don't really understand why uh, fifth, there was 50 days. I, I know that for 40 days, Yeshua was on the earth and he was uh, preparing the disciples and teaching them and, and changing their mindsets and their thinking and <clears throat> it was a 40 day of testing them and, and preparing them. Uh, so I understand the 40 days. And then there were 10 more days before the coming of uh, the comforter that he said he was sending. So what, what happened during those 50 days? I don't really know as far as people dying. Were they under the old covenant? Were they under the new covenant? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So those are things I don't really know. I don't have an answer to, but for sure, once uh, the Holy Spirit came, we know that people have to be saved individually. You're not corporately saved anymore. You can't go to the synagogue at Yom Kippur and think your name's going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Um, you know, it's an individual thing. So um, anybody have any, any of their own questions? 
I, yeah, I have a question. Okay. Um, in in the Jewish faith today, uh huh. Do, would um would rabbis teach anything? I know they don't believe the Messiah's comet. They're not messianic, but would they be teaching that they're um the Hebrews are barley, are symbolized in barley? Would they see that? No. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I would think not because then they would be able to see they were ready for harvest at a certain point. I, I, I was just interested. Right. I do think, I don't know if they would say this. I do think they have a corporate mentality. I, I do think they still think as themselves as a group that God, that God loves and saves. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So let me see everybody. So, so would that be that the rabbi, they're still doing the corporate salvation with their, I can't remember their festival or it's when all the Jews would come to Jerusalem, but right. now they're Young all people. over the place. So they're do all they do, over the place, but yeah. Luckily it's, Zoom is about, no, I'm kidding. That was rude. Anyway. <laughs> they, they do believe they all have to be in synagogue on Yom Kippur. So I don't really know, honestly. It's I, such a it's such a rich, rich religion, but um most of 